All right, welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I want to thank you all for being here for this very important presentation. The focus of today's show is the Green River Formation. It is a privilege to have Mike Ord back with us here today. Mike, thank you so much for being generous with your time for tonight's show. You're welcome. And uh, anybody in the chat who is new to this channel, uh, please check the description box. Also check the website, standingfortruthministries.com, under the categories uh, geology and the Genesis flood, where you can find all of uh, Mike Ord's past presentations and lectures with us. Uh, we've also got George, George, our award-winning co-host. George, good to see you. How you doing, brother? Oh, great to be back. Yep, good. Nice day outside, by the way. Blue sky, sunny day. I think it's around 24 degrees centigrade, so it should be a nice day. Sounds good. About the same here as well. we got to take advantage of these last few nice days. Uh, and Mike, thanks again for uh, being here. Maybe if, if there's a few things you wanted to say in terms of introduction uh, before we get into the, the actual presentation itself. Thanks again, Mike. You're welcome. Um, no. No. Um... It's about 65 degrees Fahrenheit here, um, but we had 10 inches of snow um, 10 days ago. <laughs> so we get big swings at this time of year. Yeah, yeah, those are like complete opposites. Um, <laughs> well, I got to say, I'm really excited for this. I think we scheduled this show about a month ago. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly important topic. A lot of people lately have had questions specifically on this topic. So uh, that being said, why don't we uh, just get right into the presentation, Mike? Uh, I can share your screen. As you're giving your presentation, I will save questions uh, from the chat. So anybody in the audience, if you have any questions pertaining to the topic or just flood geology in, in general, tag me at Standing for Truth, and I will save those questions for Mike. Uh, Mike, so whenever you're ready, I can share your screen. Okay. And we can get your... Okay, here it goes. Here we go. Everyone see it fine? Yes, looks good. Well, the Green River Formation is a very unique, interesting formation. And there's still a lot of questions uh, that need research and answering on it. Um, so I'm going to get right into it. Oops. <clears throat> The Green River Formation is located in southwest Wyoming, northeast Utah, and northwest Colorado, USA. The state at Eocene, or about the mid-Paleogene. Uh, uh, there's other associated formations with it. The Wasatch Formation, which intertongues with it. It's, that's more of um, a lot of conglomerate in uh, that formation. Then there's the Bridger and Washaki formations. They are mostly volcanic formations, volcanic ash especially, um, mainly volcanic ash in those formations. It's claimed as 6.5, well, no, it's not claimed, but it has 6.5 million rhythmites. It's claimed that these are varves. Varves are a rhythmite that is deposited over one year period and usually comes in two or more uh, subcouplets or sublayers. For instance, like uh, uh, sand and silt or silt and clay. It's greatly fossiliferous. There are, I guess, millions of fish in, in the Green River Formation. And here's the location. Um, I wish I had the states outlined there too, but that's where it is. It's essentially in the central Rocky Mountain areas, area of Western United States. They're in mountain valleys. And those are the names of the formation there. Uh, the fossil basin is, a lot of research has been done on that. That's a very small little basin as you can see the greater green, green river basin in wyoming is made up of the gossu basin and the washaki basin 
then in Utah, you have the, the Uinta Basin. Between the Greater Green River Basin and the Uinta Basin, you have the Uinta Mountains in this area right here. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Going yeah. back and forth. Okay. Yeah. Those mountains are up to 14,000 feet above sea level, and they separate the two basins. And then you have the Piquiance Creek Basin in, in Colorado. So that's the Green River Formation. Uh, in, in, they're in mountain basins, essentially, surrounded by mountains. And here are the, some of the rhythmites right here. Um, they're very thin. Uh, they're mostly a lot of times made of uh, uh, calcite or dolomite. Uh, John Whitmore provides a scale. We spent mm, a week looking at uh, the Green River Basin from different perspectives. I believed, and it was reinforced, that it's from the flood, and John Whitmore thinks it's from uh, a post from post flood lakes. Um, and we actually debated the issue in the journal Creation afterwards. This issue right here in 2006, you could probably get it online. And anyway, I'll be talking more about that. And here's a close up of of the. Rhythmites. In many places, they have a high organic content. In fact, they're considered oil shale, and and if the price of oil goes out the roof, <laughs> it would actually be uh, commercially feasible to um, to process this uh, the uh, for for oil. And it has a lot of fish in it. A lot of these are herring, um, called nighty, I think is the technical name. They're like a herring. And of course, a herring is a, a marine fish. I'll probably say more about that with time. And uh, so you, you have a lot of nice fish fossils, I guess millions of them in the Green River Formation. In fact, they're valuable. And they're found right in the so-called varves. And, um, and uh, people just chip away the thin um, couplets. And a lot of times you find a fish on, on one of the faces. There's another picture of uh, a fish from the Green River Formation. So the major question is, are these rhythmites really varves? In other words, do we have 6.5 million years worth of time in there? Um, there's arguments against that. Uh, for instance, the, the, you have excellently preserved fossils, as I showed, and I'll show more of them later. And um, to preserve these fossils, um, you know, the they're probably not going to last as well as they're preserved for a year. So it implies rapid uh, deposition of these rhythmites. Fish would, would have to be buried quickly. And there's uh, generally a uniform deposition over long distances. And uh, some evidence that are not bars. There's, there's two ash beds separated by 15 kilometers. And at the, at, Separate by 15 kilometers, you have different counts of uh, rhythmites. One has 12, uh, 1,238, and the other has 1,661 rhythmites between these two ash layers, strongly suggesting that these are not one year of ours. The rhythmites, essentially, and rhythmites are found a lot of places in the rock record. And sometimes they, they call them, if they're, they think they're glacial, they, they'll call them barbites. Because barbs today are a lot of times associated by, uh, with lakes uh, adjacent to glaciers. You can have them in lakes away from glaciers too, by the way. And we know that uh, in a lot of these lakes, you can have more than one 
rhythmite per year in a lot of places. So there's evidence that they're not barves. How they were deposited, um, I would say we really don't know. I don't think the uniformitarian scientists know either. Um, anyway, that's a subject for research. Arthur Strahler commented on these Green River rhythmites in his anti-creationist book called The Evolution-Creation Debate, Science and Earth History. He says, the Green River couplets are indeed a remarkable accumulation. Their regularity and vast numbers are mind-boggling. How could such uniform deposition continue for five to eight million years? See, this is the problem. They're, they're too uniform. And this kind of goes back to the uh, Castile uh, evaporite uh, rhythmites in that some of them are so uniform over such long distances, including one report of uh, you can trace the same cup, thin couplet for 110 kilometers. This is, I'd say, very difficult to be uh, explained in, um, in a lake uh, by uniformitarianism. But how we would explain it is still a subject for research. So getting back to the Green River Formation, the first thing I do when I'm looking at uh, an outcrop or a formation is, well, is it uh, from the flood or is it pre-flood or post-flood? So in this case, it's just between whether the Green River Formation is from the flood or post-flood. So once you determine which uh, environment it was formed in, you can go and start answering some of the questions the Green River Formation presents. So this is the first question that needs to be asked within uh, biblical earth history. And um, the there is evidence for a lake. Just uh, read that uh, online debate, I should say a uh, written debate with John Whitmore and I, and you'll see that there are a lot of, a lot of questions. And his evidence that it's from a lake includes what's called stromatolites, which are considered shallow water, um, uh, bulbous uh, um, LJ, uh, and... Uh, um, probably other organisms that trap and bind sediments to form uh, layers or, or, or couplets. You, they're alive today in um, Shark Bay, uh, Western Australia and the Bahamas. And there's some reported from a few other environments, uh, lake environments. So anyway, stromatolites is, is one of the evidences that's from a post-flood lake. Also, there's Catus fly pupae, which is very, very interesting. There's bird and mammal tracks. Uh, there's claims of a bird nest. There's raindrop impressions. Oh, I can see that I, 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 I need to do better at my spelling. <laughs> there's desiccation cracks. And in uh, most of the basins, there's a bullseye depositional pattern. In other words, you have kind of coarse sediments like sand or silt along the edges of the basin. As you go more into the interior basin, you get more finer grain, uh, your, your rhythmites and your um, uh, clays and your, um, yeah, finer grain sediments around it. The bullseye depositional pattern, which... Uh, is similar to a lot of lakes today where you have uh, coarser material coming in from deltas and being spread along the shoreline from uh, uh, shore parallel currents. And then in the deep, uh, a lot of times you get finer grain uh, sediments. Not always, though, because a lot of times these delta deposits slough down into the bottom of a lake. And so you should get a lot of coarse grain sediments even in the deepest part of a lake. Also, exploded fish. It's John Whitmore wrote a PhD thesis on this. And from that, he feels that uh, it's 
that you have to have shallow water and you need some time. But there's other variables that uh, can influence it, like temperature. Anyway, those are the evidence from, from a lake. And here is a uh, stromatolite, they claim, from the Green River Formation. And um, it's kind of an odd stromatolite in that uh, it's very hard to see the thin layers that are supposed to be there. And here are Catus fly pupae, and they probably are. That's, uh, I've, I've been wondering about these for ever since John Whitmore showed them to me. And here's a, a photograph of an exploded fish. The explosion occurs when gases build up and just they, they expand too fast and and break open the, the fish and spread the, the body parts all around. <laughs> anyway, okay, but there's other evidence, the Green River formations from the flood. And I believe these features are so big picture evidences that they trump the other evidences that I've showed you for a, a lake. And I'll show you some pictures of some of these features. First of all, the, some of the fossils in it are from warm climates. And if you knew the location and the altitude of, of these, um, that's very difficult. I'll talk more about that when I get to uh, some of the uh, fossils that uh, indicate the, a warm climate. The volume of of the Green River Formation is huge for a lake. Now we do have post-flood lakes in the Western United States and I've, I've examined a lot of them like Glacial Lake Missoula that broke and for, uh, caused the uh, Lake Missoula flood. Also we have a lot of uh, Ice Age lakes uh, just on the other side of where, where the Green River Formation is located uh, in Nevada and Utah uh, in the Great Basin. Some of these lakes were huge during the Ice Age. Also, there's evidence of a huge amount of erosion at the top of the formation, because a lot of the, this formation is broken up into erosional remnants. 700 meters of erosion on top, whoa. How are you gonna get that after the flood? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about these. Also, quartzite rocks, which is a metamorphic sandstone were found at a number of locations on top of the Green River Formation, indicating huge currents brought in these formation, uh, these quartzites. After eroding the top a lot, it left a lag of rounded quartzites. Also, when you look at uh, the San Rafael Swell, which is about 3,000 square kilometers in area, indicates 5,000 meters of erosion in that over that swell in the north northern Colorado plateau and the top of the formation is the Green River formation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna unpack a lot of this and talk more about each one. Here are some of the warm climate fossils, crocodiles, palms. These are these are warm climate fossils. You can't have hard, uh, below freezing temperatures for very much in the wintertime for crocodiles to live there. If this was a lake environment and the crocodile lived in a post-flood lake. And same with palms. So uh, the problem with this, the Green River Formation uh, is, is located in, well within the continent of the United States. The altitude, it... Uh, varies from about 6,000 to about over 9,000 feet above sea level, very high altitude, and very cold in the winter, and not particularly warm in the summer, I might add. Um, but say the environment it was a little different. Say that uh, this was all down by sea level, but still you're well within the continental interior, and regardless of the altitude, you're going to get 
very cold winter temperatures uh, in that location. So there, this is a very difficult problem for a post-flood lake. And to me, it is major evidence, not what I believe is more small scale or minor evidence. Also, when you, you see the stats, statistics on the Green River Formation, it, the area is 77,000 square kilometers. Wow, though, that's pretty huge. And here's the elevation, 1,500 to 2,800 meters above sea level. It straddles the Continental Divide, by the way, in the central Rocky Mountains. The, and the average depth is 600 meters. How many lakes are, are going to deposit 6, 600 meters of sediment uh, for an average? So the volume is um, 100,000 cubic kilometers. That's a lot of sediment. Where does it all come from? Um, how does it erode and get into the lake? But there's even more to it. The maximum depth in the greater Green River Basin, that's the northern part, is 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet. But in the Uinta Basin, on the northern edge of the Uinta Mountains, it's 6,800 meters thick. How, how can you say that these are from a post-flood lake? Um, these And these are major evidence is one of many. So the, the formation is, is um, to me, pretty obvious from the flood. These are what you expect in the flood. Big uh, formations, thick, widespread. And here's an example of the erosional remnants. I believe I'm up in... Uh, this is fossil basin, and you can see that a lot of it's been eroded down to the upper left, about 800 meters. And there's more erosional remnants. And here's even more. Uh, this is called the Boar's Tusk. And here's some erosional remnants of the Green River Formation indicating uh, in this area uh, 800 meters of erosion. And what's you got to form the lake, deposit all this material, and then erode the top of it 800 meters. Uh, How is that going to happen after the flood? Major issue indicates from the flood. This fits in beautifully with the recessional stage of the flood. The first half of the flood up to day 150, was a depositional stage where the sediments were deposited, and even a lot more. And then from day 150 to day 371, you had massive erosion as the cotton has come up out of the floodwaters, the ocean basin sank, and you have massive currents flowing sometimes at high speeds off the rising continents into the deepening ocean basins. So it would fit perfectly with that, the recessional stage of the flood. So what is left after this erosion would have to be from the early part of the flood, the depositional part in the first 150 days. And there's more evidence that, that indeed the Green River Formation is not a late flood formation, it's early flood formation. Some think that, well, hypercanes, which are super hurricanes that have to form over water ocean water, 40 to 45 degrees centigrade, um, could do it. Oh, but there's a lot of problems with hypercanes. This has been suggested as an explanation for the erosion. Anyway, the original research for this comes from uh, the journal Geophysical Research, Emanuel et al., 1995. Um, he states, uh, he, he's the prime researcher, secular researcher on Hypercanes. Hypercanes are hypothetical. They're like super hurricanes, but they need more time to form. In order for hypercanes to develop, the mean wind would have to be small enough relative to the size of the sea surface temperature anomaly to permit the storm to develop in the time it takes to cross the anomaly. 
Given a development time of 40 hours, mean wind, wind would have to be less than one meter per second or two miles an hour to allow hypercane development over a 100 kilometer scale sea surface temperature anomaly. In other words, you have to have currents that are very slight so that the, the hot water anomaly stays stationary essentially. And you can't have strong winds to move the anomaly or the atmospheric uh, buildup uh, off of the hot spot. So you need real slow winds. How's, where are you going to get this in the post flood world? Not only that, hypercanes would generally follow hurricane uh, tracks. And the West United States is not on any hurricane tracks, it's too far north. And besides that, when a hurricane moves on inland, it quickly uh, loses its energy because its energy source is the hot water, the warm water that build up all through the summer. And um, hypercanes would work the same way. But once they move inland, they, they quickly decay because they lose their energy source. You can get a lot of heavy rain in the process, but you can only get so much rain in a storm because you can only have so much volume of water vapor in a storm. And if you rained it all out, you might only get about two inches in a, in a storm because you got to have a continuous input of moisture into a storm to get, um, say, 50 inches of, of precipitation. So all this is just, uh, uh, it won't work, <laughs> essentially. And it's right in my field of atmospheric science, by the way. <clears throat> Also, I, I pointed out that quartzite rocks were deposited over many areas. When Whitmore and I were looking, we found many areas of quartzite. These are these rounded rocks. Some of them are quite large, boulder sized, rounded by water. And there's several sources of where these could come from. Um, the ones in the northern greater Green River Basin probably came from central Idaho. That's the nearest source. Those in say the Uinta Basin probably came from some of the mountains in Nevada or Western Utah that has some quartzite. Even in Southeast Idaho, there's some mountains that have quartzite. But anyway, they're long distance transport. So during the erosion of much of the Green River Formation, it left a lag. Uh, when the current slowed, it, it dropped the, uh, some of the rocks it was carrying and in this case, it was quartzite, the more resistant rocks. It's one of the hardest rocks in the world. Uh, I think it has a, a hardness of seven on the Mohs scale. This is the Colorado Plateau. And it's about, oh, 300 and some odd, 300,000 square kilometers. Here's the San Rafael swell right here in the, in the northwest corner. It bowed up like this. And along the edges here, it didn't erode uh, the material on the edge, but it eroded it all over this swell. And here's uh, the Uinta Basin, where you have the Green River Formation. Uh, uh, that's up to 6,800 meters deep next to the Uinta Mountains right here. And here's the greater Green River Basin up in here. So the San Rafael Swell is part of the Colorado Plateau. And the secular scientists have estimated the erosion. You can estimate the amount of erosion in an area by several ways. Like if you have a dome that uplifts and the center gets eroded, by trigonometry, you use the, the angle of the dip of the edges, the distance to the center, and, and the angle by trigonometry, you can estimate the amount of erosion in the center of the dome. And that's what I do, I'm gonna do with the San Rafael Swell. But you can do a lot of other places on the Colorado Plateau because it's made up of domes and, and, and sinking basins. But the secular scientists say there's been an average of erosion over the Colorado Plateau of 2,500 to 5,000 meters, average erosion over this whole area. Now, obviously, that erosion has to occur late uh, in the flood as the waters were sweeping off the rising continents. 
And the San Rafael swell is one of those areas you can actually make a calculation. And the way I, I discovered this is I was driving into the area, coming from the north, the Uinta Basin, and I was going along the bedding plains of the Green River Formation that you see along the edges here of the path. And I was coming up to the pass, about 9,000 feet above sea level. And the dip of the, the, of the beds down to the north uh, continued out into the air. I mean, it would have over the San Rafael Swell. And when I drove down, uh, the I think it's the Book and Roan Cliffs to Price, Utah, the angle of the dip was all about the same, about eight degrees down to the north. So based on trigonometry, I can calculate how much uh, erosion occurred in the, the central part of the San Rafael Swell, way out in here, uh, in the air now. And when I got down close to the uh, Price, Utah, um, the angle of the dip of the beds was about eight degrees. Now, I was conservative when I made this estimate, thinking, well... And you have to always go perpendicular to the dip. You can't measure it at an angle. And so it's eight degrees all the way down approximately. But I was conservative and said, well, let's try it. Maybe I made a mistake and it's six degrees. By the way, there's a marker coal bed right down there showing a coal seam where it has a flat bottom and a flat top. Very common with coal seams. Very difficult to explain by the peat swamp theory that uniformitarians use. Anyway, based on that dip, and when I looked north of the pass at the Green River Formation, there was a lot of relief still. So the sedimentary rocks that were at the pass are down here, tilted down to the north. And then the Green River Formation had a lot of erosion right in here that would have to have actually occurred well above the pass at one time. So to put it all together, um, the San Rafael Swell centers out in here. Here's Price, Utah. And here's the dip of the beds right here. Here's the pass right here. And the relief of about 600 meters or 800 meters. It could be uh, right in here. But from the pass... On down, you can just use trigonometry and a dip of eight degrees. Anyway, when you add up all these factors, this is the erosion I got over the San Rafael Swell. 4,200 if the dip is six degrees to 5,100 meters if the dip is eight degrees, which I think is the true dip. So 5,000 feet of erosion over the San Rafael Swell. Okay. Looking at this a little deeper, the Green River Formation forms the top formation in this sequence. So for the Green River Formation to be a, a post-flood lake, you'd have to deposit all this sediment right in here, generally flat over the area. And then it bows up into the San Rafael Swell and the center gets eroded. 5,000 meters about gets eroded leaving this, the Green River Formation at the very top. How likely is this after the flood? I'm gonna, I'll repeat this. First of all, if the Green River Formation is a post-flood lake, it has to uh, form on top of these other formations, which presumably would be from the flood, you know, several thousand feet thick or, or maybe a uh, thousand meters thick on top. It'd have to be deposited first, and then it has to bow up. And then much of this was eroded over 3,000 square kilometers um, all after the flood. And by the way, the erosional material is gone. It's nowhere found on the continents. It's been eroded like many other areas of the continents, completely off the continent, except for maybe some coastal basins like in southern Texas, but it's mostly been uh, deposited on the continental margin, forming the continental margin 
it forms the continental slope, and I mean the shelf slope and the slope. That's where you find the material. That's a flood signature, obvious flood signature. I, I can't stress this more. The Green River Formation is a flood deposit. Now, the reason that a lot of some creation scientists like to say it's from a post-flood lake is because of where they put the flood post-flood boundary. I've been working, I've been studying this for 25 years from various areas of geology and some also some areas of atmospheric science like climate evidence and, and miscellaneous. Anyway, this is a table of 33 evidences that the that the flood post-flood boundaries in the late Cenozoic. Those that believe the Green River Formation is a post-flood lake put the flood post-flood boundary down near the Cretaceous tertiary or the Cretaceous Paleogene or Cretaceous Paleocene. It's all the same. Um, or maybe a little above or vary it some in there. And so that's, so as a result, they have to suggest or claim that much of the Cenozoic is post-flood including the Green River Formation, the origin of Grand Canyon, uh, the thousands of water gaps across the earth, planation surfaces, uh, long transported quartzites, and many other features they have to say uh, formed after the flood. But when you look at these features, uh, there's 33, there's even more. Tim Clary has done more research and, and added two more to these, which aren't aren't here. And the strength is is is, is an arbitrary um, value, uh, considering how well those who believe the the flood post flood boundaries at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, uh, how well they can explain it. I'm just going to mention a few of these. Uh, like thick, pure coal seams. You have a lot of thick, pure coal seams in the Cenozoic, clear up into the Miocene, which is considered the late Cenozoic. Um, and coal seams are no way can they form, hate to be dogmatic, but when you think about trying to form a coal seam after the flood, it just blows your mind. These are uh, flood features from the floating log mats uh, and the deposition of this vegetation in various areas uh, within the sedimentary rock column, and the sediments were increasing rapidly. So the thick pure coal seams, number nine there, um, the fact that you have so much Cenozoic coal, some of these coal seams, like in the Powder River Basin, which I believe John Whitmore and others think is post-flood, are 200 feet thick of almost pure coal. How could these form after the flood? Now, obviously, I believe a flood signature. Also, you, uh, tectonic evidence. You had significant tech, uh, vertical tectonics uh, in the Cenozoic, especially late in the Cenozoic. You had evidence of mountains going up 40,000 feet versus the, the, the basins that sank. Um, all over through the Rocky Mountains, from mid to late Cenozoic, you had the, uh, the huge uplift and sinking of the basins in between. According to Psalm 1048, the valleys, the mountains rose, the valleys sank down to drain the floodwaters where God uh, uh, placed them. So how can all this tectonics occur after the flood? And then there's a significant erosion of the continents, geomorphic evidence. For instance, how much erosion occurred on the continents? I've just been figuring this out just recently based on the amount of sediments in the oceans. They now have a good calculation. And I had to make, I had to figure out how much uh, was deposited from post-flood river uh, also and from post-flood ice age uh, a deposition of microorganisms. But, and a, a conservative estimate estimate is 
1,900 meters were eroded off during the recessional stage of the flood. 1,900 meters. It's mostly along the continental margins, which can be up to 18 to 20 kilometers thick of sediments offshore. So this is a strong signature that this erosion occurred during the recessional stage of the flood. Anyway, and this would occur during this, mostly during the Cenozoic, which would be considered post-flood by some people. So obviously the flood post-flood boundary is really high uh, in the rock record. It's, um, I'd say generally at the Pliocene Pleistocene, but it can be lower down. Um, I, uh, for instance, I believe the Australian marsupials are lower down. I have a paper written on that subject that's in review right now. And um, other areas I think are up into the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene is no magic uh, uh, time slot for the Ice Age. It's the Ice Age um, time frame for the uniformitarian scientist, but it need not be for ours because um, there's a lot of Pleistocene sediments uh, in some valleys that are uh, over a thousand meters thick. And um, how can this be deposited after the flood? So I, I believe that thousand meters or plus, more than a thousand meters was a, is a flood signature, implying that, he, that in some places the early Pleistocene is, is from the flood. Anyway, the, the boundary is not a magic time within the uniformitarian system, which is an arbitrary uh, system with a lot of problems. So we can use it, which I've done, to bracket the general frame. And so the general frame is anywhere from Miocene to up to uh, Pleistocene for the boundary. And this is strong evidence that, that uh, the Green River formation is from the flood, just because of all this other evidence worldwide and from many geological areas, sedimentary rocks, organic evidence, tectonics, geomorphology, and then even from climate evidence. Uh, volcanic winter, for instance, um, there's those volcanic formation, the Bridger and the Washiki formation associated with the Green River formation of vol volcanic ash implying a huge amount of volcanism. Well, if this is post-flood, there'd be so much volcanism that you'd cause a volcanic winter if it's post-flood, which would be a problem for those warm climate fossils uh, that they that they're claimed to be post-flood in the, in the Green River Formation. Anyway, the upshot of this is, to me, the evidence is very clear that it's a flood deposit, but there's challenges explaining features that would be more indicative of a lake deposit. So this is all a subject of future research. Okay, let's talk about some of that evidence from a lake. Stromatolites. I have examined them and I'm more and more come to the conclusion that they're non-organic. They're not uh, like the stromatolites that are alive today. The ones in the rocks are non-biological. Some of the evidence I have is that those in the rock record are practically all found in carbonate rocks. While stromatolites today bind all kinds of sediments, not just carbonates, uh, sandstones, silt, uh, small little pieces of fossils. Also, the stromatolites in the rock record, you, you rarely find any associated biological material like a microorganism, microfossil. I mean, there's a lot of microfossils in the Precambrian, I might add. And so by chance, you should get, and also in the after the Precambrian, in the Phanerozoic. Um, so by chance, you're going to get some micro uh, fossils within these, but by far, there's hardly any indicating that uh, possible non-organic mechanism. Anyway, this is a subject for future research. 
Oh, one more piece of evidence I need, I, I can add. Stromatolites are especially abundant in the Precambrian. But they're also uh, fairly abundant in the Phanerozoic. That is your rocks with uh, fossils like the Ordovician, uh, the Cambrian, uh, so forth. They're found in a lot of different places. And practically all um, flood geologists uh, believe that the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, especially, are from the flood. There's, there's questions about the Cenozoic, as I, I've already alluded to. But the Paleozoic and Mesozoic have a lot of stromatolites. And how are you going to form these things? Because it obviously takes a time to form a stromatolite alive today. And so you got to have a mechanism that forms them quickly. And I believe that that, organ, that mechanism is non-biological. Now, the other ones, I believe, can be explained by, or most of these, uh, number two, the cicadas fly pupae, bird mammal tracks, bird nests, raindrop impression. This desiccation cracks can be explained by the what I call the beds model for the origin of dinosaur tracks, eggs, and scavenged bone beds, which I believe I presented on this uh, on this uh, site before. You can probably look it up and see that. The bullseye depositional pattern is more difficult to explain, but if you have the mountains rising, the basin sinking, and the flood level is going down, for a while, this could be kind of like a lake, and then you'd have sediments coming mostly from the coursers coming from the mountains that are exposed or, or just barely underwater. And then out in the middle, uh, you can have finer grain. So, I mean, I could see this occurring uh, very late uh, in the flood, the, this bullseye depositional pattern. Exploded fish, I believe, can have formed by the beds model, assuming that uh, they imply shallow water. Anyway, the beds hypothesis, bed stands for briefly exposed diluvial sediments. Diluvial is another name for the flood. Flood sediments, briefly exposed, freshly laid down sediments on beds, on a, a bedding plain. So why would you have beds during the flood? Well, because sea level, quote unquote, or the level of the flood would be oscillating during the flood. So you'd have local drops that can expose freshly laid sediment over maybe a large area and then rises to cover up all this material and preserve it such as dinosaur features, which I've applied this model for dinosaur tracks, eggs, and scavenged bone beds that are made early in the flood before the recessional stage. So here's kind of a schematic on how beds work. Oftentimes you find dinosaur tracks and eggs in areas of thick sediments. So it's an area of rapid deposition so in time T1 right here, the top of the sediment's here, but you have in rapid deposition. Soon after that, time T2, it's up that thick. Time three, it's like that. And you can see it shallows. The bottom of the flood waters and the top are not too far apart. And then sea level is going to be oscillating. Early in the flood, it's going to be generally going up, oscillating while it's going up. So it's a general rise, but with oscillations. And then so um, when it gets shallow like that, it can have a, a local drop can expose uh, the freshly laid sediments. And by the way, this is just a block diagram. And would, you know, for a schematic for a larger area, it could be maybe uh, 200 kilometers wide, this, this area representing. And that's a lot of area. And so animals like dinosaurs in the floodwaters uh, could embark 
on on this land. I mean, that's hey, that's 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 land. I'm heading for it. And they they start making tracks, lay eggs, and scavenge dead dinosaurs, which should probably be a lot of them around. And then a local rise covers up and deposits sediment over the, that, preserving them. And it can happen several times. Um, I think this model can account for those features like um, true desiccation cracks. You can form a desiccation crack within one day. So if it's exposed one day and it's dry enough, you can crack it. But a lot of these desiccation cracks are probably not uh, bud cracks. They could be what's called cinerisis cracks, which form underwater due to changes in salinity, this sort of, they, they know about these. There's a wide literature on them. In fact, the belt supergroup sediments, which uh, uh, form, are, are close to where I live, or have abundant uh, uh, cracks, but hardly anyone believes they're true mud cracks. They believe they're cinerisis cracks formed underwater. And this could easily be the case with a lot of those in the Green River Formation. But there could also be true mud cracks uh, in the beds model. Also, you can form a raindrop imprints. You can form uh, insect nests, like Cadiz uh, fly uh, pupae, uh, bird nests, bird tracks. There's lots of bird tracks on, on beds with dinosaur tracks. You can form mammal tracks, like you find in the Green River Formation, and bird tracks. So this model can explain some of those features that, uh, that are uh, brought up uh, for evidence that it's a lake, post-flood lake. Then, of course, a local sea level rise covers them and preserves them. See, a lot of these features are, are ephemeral. They will be eroded fast. So you got to cover them up fairly fast. And not with too strong a current that you erode them, but enough of a current and with that's muddy, it'd be a muddy water and enough to deposit and protect uh, what was formed on the beds. And of course, there's five mechanisms that cause the sea uh, flood levels to go oscillate up and down. I'm not going to go into these uh, in any detail. I just mentioned lunar tides, which would probably be very large on a general, uh, mostly flooded earth. And so you're going to have two of those a day going up and down. Tsunamis would be mostly destructive, of course, but after they hit the beach, they roll out and slow down. And so they can uh, slow down and cover up um, uh, freshly uh, features formed on the beds. Anyway, there's more of them there. Anyway, if you want to know more about all, all about the beds model, this is the book where it's um, developed in a fair amount of detail in this book, Dinosaur Challenges and Mysteries, How the Genesis Flood Makes Sense of Dinosaur Evidence, Including Tracks, Nests, Eggs, and Dinosaur Bed Bones. By the way, there's very few dinosaur nests. There's maybe, I have a picture of one true one, but but sometimes they define a nest as just a broken up eggs. I mean, they, they're poor definitions. Most of the time, these eggs are on flat bedding planes, and they're porous, so they're going to dry out fast. So, so a, a, a reptile, a dinosaur, is either going to dig a hole and cover it with vegetation or something like this, but there's no evidence of such things. So nests are very rare, maybe less than a dozen uh, around the world. Anyway, that's all I have. Um, so I'm open for questions, and I guess I'll hit stop sharing, right? Yes. Yeah, you got it. Mike, thank you so much for another uh, fantastic presentation. Very technical, very important. We've had a great audience uh, with a ton of great feedback and compliments. Okay. Um, I always appreciate your visuals and slides as well, Mike. I always go back afterwards, rewatch and make notes and <laughs> study them as, as best as I can. Uh, you have so much knowledge, Mike. So I appreciate that. Well, 45 um, years of research. It shows. It shows, brother. Uh, <laughs> you're a blessing. Um, George, 
before we get into some of these questions, we do have a good list of questions. Also, uh, anybody wants to ask any questions now as we are doing this Q&A, feel free to do so. And that way we can actually put it up on screen as well. Uh, any of the questions for the first hour, I've just had to save and put in a separate document. But if you have any questions uh, now moving forward, I can put it up on screen for Mike. Uh, George, any thoughts, anything you wanted to add uh, before we get into these questions? Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I do actually. I, I wanted to add something to support uh, what Mike was saying, but I need to share my screen. So Mike's not all go not going to have all the glory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, George, and and this will be a, a well-deserved break for you, Mike, as uh, <laughs> George. Okay. In the screen. Uh, okay. Can you can you see that? Yes, it looks like uh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I uh, okay, okay. Uh, f first of all, I have to thank uh, our friends at um, Creation Research, John Mackay, uh, Joseph Hubbard, and Sam Jenkins. Uh, they put me onto this uh, particular. I'll explain. I'll explain what it is. It they refer to it as a as a water mold, but it's more more like a um, uh, what, what would you call it? Um, the the proper name is um, Oomycetes. It's it's a type of water mold, and it and it's inter it's an interesting organism, really, that uh, shares some features with the fungi. They often grow in aquatic and damp environments, uh, but uh, they also found in dry areas. One of them is called the uh, Saprolegnia and Phytophthora. Uh, they're important examples of the group. In uh, the case of Saprolegnia, it's a common cause of the so called fungi infections experienced by freshwater fish. One of the one of the arguments one of the arguments that uh, John McKay and Joseph Hubbard have, have put forward. Shush. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah. It, it, yeah, one of the arguments they put forward <laughs> is um, with those valves, they're very thin and they claim that they're annual. Now, imagine this particular um, Oo uh If there's a dead fish in the area, they will devour it in no time at all. As a matter of fact, a lot of fish farmers – they're very quick to remove dead fish from their farm. Otherwise, once this thing takes a hold, they literally have to empty their entire dam of all their fish. So this is another piece of evidence that suggests that those valves can't be um, millions of years old, um, that they couldn't possibly bury the fish in time to create a fossil. And uh, I think Mike mentioned that... Um, I think they find millions of of fossil fish. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I, I I actually read about this last night, and uh, uh, this doesn't contradict you, Mike. But they they claim that there are five hundred thousand complete fossil fishes, with emphasis on the complete, meaning that they would have to have been buried quickly to be fossilized in com in a complete form. The other interesting part that I found was it included with all those fossils, there were birds, snakes, bats, mm -hmm. crocodiles, lizards, turtles. Get it, wait a, now, get a lot of this stingrays. Yeah, I forgot to mention that stingrays. Yep. Yeah, mammals, insects, sponges. Yeah, sponges. Yep. Mm -hmm. S snails, clams. Various arachnids, various crustaceans, a, 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 alongside many plants and microfossils. So there's lots of evidence for a worldwide flood type uh, scenario. But it's mm -hmm. interesting. You can see this this particular mold. It will get into anything. That's a dead fly in the water. That is sesame seed. They'll, they'll devour anything. Now, for the people in the audience, if you want to read about this particular mould, I've got some references there that uh, I can provide those in the comments section. You can read about it yourself. They're short reads, but uh, it's interesting t to really have a look at that and, and, see, and see what we're actually saying. Um, 
the other, the other thing too, Mike, is uh, I think you'll you'll be aware of this. These valves, I think they I think they're from one of your reports. They're bent. How do you get bent layers over millions of years mm. if they've got if they've hardened? And that's another. This this one is uh, unbelievable. This, this this just blew my mind. I thought, well, how can that happen? In a millions of years scenario type um, deposition. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think I think uh, I've pretty much said what I was going to say ab about uh, the Green River formation. Uh, the va the valves issue keeps coming up lots of times, and it's very easily um, refuted. Really, that there are so many examples uh, that you could cite. For for quick deposition, it's it's amazing. Uh, I'll, I'll just scroll down to to this um, document that I created in, uh, and it, it really took me two days to do. By the way, it, it doesn't take long to actually research this stuff and find out the millions of years is is baloney. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll just cite Mount St Helens. You look at the, the, those very very thin layers. They that. That layer there was laid in three hours. It was formed in three hours. As you can see, from from uh, that's from um, Refuting Compromise, the book. I took the picture of the page uh, last night. And uh, I think you're aware of, of this one too, where they've actually found ash beds uh, with varying um, counts of... Um, of these valve layers you can see there from two ash beds they found 1160 to 1568 counts of valves mm -hmm. how could that be you know two 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 ash layers should have the same um count uh of valves uh another another example there you can you can see 1960 uh, hurricane donna struck the coast of south florida and deposited a blanket of thinly laminated lime mud six inches thick swiss lake another example mm -hmm. uh, in which up to five pairs of layers were found built up in a single year brian i'm aware of that yeah yeah and then of course lake segutsu this is a beautiful one two cores were done there's those ash beds that i was talking about with different valve counts between them Mm, yes. How, how, can, how can that be? And of course, just to plug uh, my my mate John McKay and uh, Joseph Hubbard, uh, Friday the twenty second. Uh, it's actually Saturday for me at seven a.m. But they're doing they're doing a conversation on um, when should a Christian disobey the government? Uh, I find I always find uh, them very interesting. So if you want to tune in, you're welcome to. Uh, yeah, that's that's really all I had, uh, uh, Mike. I'll, I'll, I'll probably um, get into a little bit of discussion with you about biomass because that's another issue that people uh, bring up uh, quite a bit, and I've done a bit of research on that, and, I, and I'm sure you know about it as well. Yes, I do. Well, thank okay, you, George. Yeah. yeah, yeah, some great visuals. Uh, Mike, George, you guys make a great team. I would not want to be on the other side having to uh, go against you guys. So great visuals, great, uh, great presentations and, and arguments. So I appreciate it. Um, with all the questions here, I don't know where to start. So I think I'm going to start with a couple of the questions that came in, Mike, over Facebook. Uh, because you've been on here several times before. I think this is your fifth time now. So there have been some questions. This one specifically came in. And the question is, Mike... Um, and I'll read it word for word. Since the flood buried fossils and the ice age buried fossils, not in ice, why don't we find the same level of soft tissue preservation in several hundred year old flood layers? I guess we're finding different types of preservation in like the post flood uh, period and then also in the global flood itself. How come they're... Different? Uh, Does that make sense, Mike? Yes. Um, that was actually one of my 33 criterion. Um, I have generally found that post-flood fossils like mammoths, um, those sorts of things are not even fossilized. But 
flood fossils most of the time are permineralized fossils, fossilized, but there's exceptions. That's why I, I advocate using multiple criterion. Uh, for instance, we know that there's soft tissues that are from the flood and dinosaur, uh, dinosaur bones, for instance, and other organisms. Also, I've read where locally you can permineralize a bit uh, some of those uh, post-flood uh, animals that lived during the Ice Age. So it's not a foolproof thing, but I'm not quite sure of the question. I see it here, the first one on the chat. Yes, and, and that's the way it came in, uh, word for word. Apparently, there's more um, preservation oftentimes in fossil organisms post-flood, but shouldn't there be, uh, I guess the... the oh, okay, I think I understand what he's saying. Um, he's wondering why we don't find actually soft tissues like we do with... Uh, uh, some dinosaur uh, fossils or remains. Mm. Well, that's true. We don't find a lot except the woolly mammoths and other organisms frozen in the permafrost in Siberia and Alaska in the Yukon Territory, Northwest Canada. Sometimes you find whole carcasses, but, but that's rare, very rare. Most of the time you find scraps of flesh um, but you do find soft tissue that's been frozen in that case. If it's not frozen uh, in a lot of other areas, yeah, the soft tissue is um, generally gone. I think, I think the reason why you don't seem to have soft tissue other than frozen or maybe special environments uh, post-flood, where you have some in the flood is because the flood was a rapid deposition and you had in some place the special chemical sediments, hot water in places. You had a lot of variables, and some of these variables with rapid deposition, rapid fossilization could preserve soft tissues. But after the flood, I mean, we, well, I mean, when they die during the Ice Age, we've had about 4,000 years for the soft tissues to decay. Uh, and that that's very reasonable. That's what you expect in a very short time, in 4,000 years. But in the year of the flood, with rapid deposition of special variables, uh, chemicals in the in the waters, um, you can have soft preservation in the flood, but not necessarily after the flood that much. That's a great response, Mike. Um, makes a lot of sense as well, because uh, it looks like this criticism was was being put forth as a major objection to. Oh, flood really? Water. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I thought that was. Um, you know, you provided a, a great answer and you mentioned the mammoth. So I'll ask this question and then, uh, George, I'll hand it to you um, to kind of pick out the next question, I'm trying to scroll up to where it was. I've got, Mike, I've got your book behind me, uh, Frozen in Time. I highly recommend that for people. I've also got your book, Rock Solid Answers. In Frozen in Time, you spend a great deal of time talking about the mammoths. Yes. And, and, and there's a lot of questions pertaining to to the mammoths that have come in uh in in variations of, of kind of the same question so in other words are, are mammoths best explained by young earth creation or deep time evolution because the critics will say that mammoths could not have adapted as quickly as we as young earth creationists say post flood right we really only have um a thousand years maybe right after the flood where we'd also have the ice age mm -hmm. and then would there be rapid adaptation uh what are your thoughts I, I know you've got a whole book on it but maybe just kind of in a nutshell well uh the kind is uh the, the genesis kind is um probably at the order level when it comes to proboscidea that is your elephant types and so it included, uh, uh, there's a lot of fossil elephant types. But after the flood, uh, you, well, first of all, I think you had two uh, elephant types uh, all from the one kind on the ark. And when they spread out, when they left the ark, they were able to differentiate uh, into the elephants we see today, Asian, African elephant, mastodons, mammoths and possibly one or two other 
types of elephants. So the mammoth was was one of those from the elephant kind on the ark, and so you those those genes were differentiated, and and uh, so they spread out there, and um, and just mushroomed all over the globe as, or the northern hemisphere by the millions, and ended up uh, probably. Mm, little before midway in the Ice Age, I think, up into, or no, probably early in the Ice Age, up into Siberia, Alaska, and, and were able to spread through into Alaska over the uh, Bering Land Bridge, which I think was tectonically raised early in the Ice Age, and then down the Ice Free Corridor into the United States, Central America, and Central South America, plus a lot of other animals. Um, so you you have plenty of time for millions of mammoths uh, in a short ice age of 700 years, which I've calculated in my book. So did I answer the question or did I get off in some um, red no. herrings? No, I think you did answer the question. And I was also going to recommend again that book and your many, many articles on the topic. Um that you can find on CMI. One that comes to mind is uh, woolly mammoths were cold adapted. But I think you nailed yep. it there when it comes to the genes from the elephant archetypes off of the ark being differentiated around the globe. Mm -hmm. And environmental conditions can oftentimes uh, turn a lot of these genes on through epigenetic yes. means. So, right, I think that that uh, for the woolly mammoth was actually is the same should be the same species as the Colombian mammoth in the U.S. and and also in Europe they give them it's the same thing. Uh, 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 other type they give them different names, but um, there's there's uh, there's intergradings in these and uh, but the the long hair in the woolly mammoths probably is an adaptation. Uh, caused by switching on of a whole genes, what operon genes, you biologist, and well, the, the Columbian mammoth generally lived a little further south where it was warmer, didn't need that, so, but they were a lot larger, the Columbian mammoth was a lot larger than the woolly mammoth, so yeah, there was a, these adaptations uh, caused by the ice age. Yeah, I, I think those are some great points, uh, Mike, so you would say the evidence better supports the position that says these mammoths were cold adapted post flood during the ice age as compared yes. to, I think there's other positions that say they were flash frozen maybe during the flood. So therefore they would have had to be pre flood. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I've delved into that. They're flash frozen. The person who advocates that believes it was early in the flood. Well, all these mammoth fossils would be down at the bottom of the sedimentary pile. But at the very top, they're in uh, in Siberia and Alaska. They're in permafrost, which is mm -hmm. permanently frozen soil that's at the top. Uh, they're not in ice. They're in permafrost. It has a lot of ice in it, um, but they're not in the ice itself. So, and I I made a case they're buried in um, in various uh, magnitude dust storms. Yes, and that's how they got into the permafrost. But there's a lot of more details than that. That, that book that you uh, pointed out that they can go into. But I see one question here uh, that I want to quickly mention. Um, sure. How did 90% of large Australian Ice Age animals go extinct? Yes. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Well, <laughs> at the end of just the last Ice Age in the Uniformitarian Scheme, which has 50 Ice Ages now, uh, you had this massive extinction, just the last, which indicates that maybe there's just one and, you know, in North America, it's 70% went extinct, 80-some percent in South America. Now, that one, I don't quite know how that happened. Australia, about 90%, he's correct. Well, it's because you had a, uh, a climate change um, at that time. You went from wet to dry um, in Australia. And so uh, that stress, especially the large animals... So you did have enough climate change. Late, the post-flood lakes uh, shriveled or, or dried up totally. So you did have a, a, a lot of, uh, of 
climate change at the end of the ice age, that's when they went extinct. So, yeah, I believe that can be explained by the ice age. But South American ice age extinctions, I haven't really nailed too well. The North American and European, European about 40% went extinct. I think that was just um, uh, drought, strong winds, and um, just, yeah, drought especially. And this would affect all the continents, probably South America too. So all these factors uh, play into the, the mass extinction, which is uh, claimed just at the end of the last ice age. There weren't any similar extinction at the end of the other 49 ice ages indicating just one ice age. <laughs> so anyway, let's go on to the rest of the questions. No, that's a great response. And um, I want to point out to the audience, because as I point, um, said earlier, we do have a lot of new uh, subscribers and supporters. And for those who have not yet watched your lecture with us on the ice age, uh, firstly, I highly recommend it. Please check it out either on the website or in the description box of this video. Um, briefly, Mike, can you go over a couple reasons why the flood model and, and young earth creation better explains why there was an ice age in the first place as oh, compared to deep time. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. Oh, oh, Donnie, or, or they can buy Mike's uh, video, which I've got, and watch it. Yes. Lots of yes. information in that. <laughs> yeah, I, um, AIG has a video uh, on me doing that, and same with CMI and other organizations. So they're they're widely out there. I don't know mm -hmm. where and where, uh, and anything about them. I, I don't pay any attention to <laughs> what's out there because I, I'm swamped with research. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get more answers out there. So um, um, what was the question precisely? Uh, maybe just a, a couple reasons why the global flood and the young earth creation position or model best or better explains the existence of an ice age anyways as compared to the you know the actual less or deep time proponents oh yes that's it okay well you need uh, generally three things for an ice age you need uh, cooler summers winters are generally cold enough um you need much more precipitation and it has to persist it can't just be a climate change for a season it has to persist year after year um, because of these are very hard, especially when you realize the temperature change must be 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the northern United States, cooling in the summertime on the average. Uh, and the, the fact that the cooler the air, the less moisture it can hold. And, um, therefore, if you find a cooling mechanism, you dry the air. So <laughs> that's why there's 60 theories on the origin of the ice age. Most popular one right now is the Milankovitch theory or the astronomical theory of the ice age, which depends on very small, slight changes in radiation. Meteorologists have said over the years that this was invented in the middle 1800s that it's too weak. But the flood can account for all this. The flood was a gigantic volcanic event with a lot of meteorite impacts. And so after the flood, you'd have this shroud of volcanic material uh, meteorite impact material up in the stratosphere trapped. A lot of it, uh, the larger particles fall off fairly quick, but the finer particles like sulfuric acid aerosols would float in the atmosphere for anywhere from uh, one to 10 years, depending on how high up in the stratosphere they, they, they ended up. And so the, the, seek, the, the point of this is that these particles reflect sunlight back to space, cooling the land especially the, the continents, because the water wouldn't cool at all because it has a high heat capacity. Also, you need abundant moisture. Uh, where'd that come from? Well, uh, the flood was a, was a heat event too. Lava flows, fountains of the great deep. The pre-flood ocean was, would be warmer to start with. So after the flood, you'd have warm oceans from pole to pole and top to bottom. And what this is going to cause is much more evaporation especially at mid and high latitudes, where the sea surface temperature would be much warmer than it is today. So your major evaporation over uh, uh, compared to today would be at mid and high latitudes. 
And that's where you need it to get caught in storms to dump on the nearby land for a rapid ice age. And this would persist for a while and it would persist as long as the, the, you got enough evaporation uh, from the ocean and enough uh, uh, cooling from the, the stratospheric aerosols, we call them, fine particles floating in the stratosphere for years. And But you can time the ice age this way because, especially with the cooling of the ocean, it, it cools from the top, from the top, then down. And um, it takes time to cool the ocean. So you can time it based on some reasonable assumptions. Uh, I timed it to about uh, 500 years to for glacial maximums and about 200 years to melt it all based on the cooling time of the ocean. So it persists for many years. So you have all the ingredients you need for a rapid ice age, which, um, which uniformitarians uh, have very difficult explaining it. For instance, there's something in the ice age called disharmonious associations. It's a global pattern. It's the rule where you have animals that love the warmth with animals that love the cold uh, in the same layers. And it's, I mean, the uniformitarians, their ice age models is cold everywhere, winter and summer. So they might be able to get some cold climate animals in some of these areas not glaciated, but where are they going to get the warm climate animals that are found there? Same with plants, uh, also the same pattern. Um, but this can be accounted for in, a, in a, the rapid ice age, especially early in the ice age, midway in the ice age also. So um, um, there's many features that can that document that, that this ice age caused by the flood is a real event which also indicates the flood was a real event. And I have a lot of documentation. In fact, uh, I'm finishing a new book that's semi in depth with CMI. It's almost finished being reviewed on many of these topics, updating what I've written before, adding and adding new stuff. So look for that in about a mm, year or two. <laughs> it it <laughs> takes a lot of time to get these things out. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Such an informative answer, uh, Mike. I really appreciate it and uh, definitely going to be looking forward to that book. Um, I appreciate it. George, anything you wanted to add uh, or, or maybe there's a, a question you wanted to. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a question. Um, where, where we talk a lot about the gold standard in science uh, here, Mike, uh, that is um, the, the, um, making the testable predictions. So uh, this is a question from uh, uh, Mr. Ryan Lloyd. He asks, what are some future testable predictions in flood geology? Testable predictions. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am reluctant to make predictions because I was a weather forecaster for 30 years. <laughs> 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 I know where you're coming from. Uh, <laughs> and it's a good background for creation research because, you know, uh, it's it's sometimes difficult to be dogmatic, even though I was that way in the Green River Formation. But I, I'd say the evidence supports that. But hardly any areas am I that dogmatic um, because I realized it's easy to be wrong. You can um, glob onto the wrong piece of evidence ignore some other evidences and come to the wrong conclusions. So, and, and I've done this. I mean, I've, I've had a hundred percent chance of precip and nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's very embarrassing, but it makes you think and, and eat a lot of humble pie. And so, um, so predictions, oh. I mean, I, I can, I can do a lot of expectations, but, Actual predictions, I'd have to think about that because I I don't think about that at all as far as flood geology and the Ice Age go. I appreciate how about, that. How about, how about we, we, we will continue to find evidence of um, humans living with dinosaurs? Um, well, we find some great post-flood evidence for dinosaurs like that. Uh, Bass relief in Cambodia that shows what looks, sure looks like a stegosaurus to me. Yep. 
Um, most of your, your audience probably knows about that. And then there's other indications, uh, drawings, pictographs of, of dinosaurs, uh, so or dinosaur-like features. So um, I'd say there's a lot of evidence for uh, some dinosaurs lived post-flood, and you know they'd come off the ark, and uh, and man probably killed a lot of them, and uh, and gave and, and probably started the legends about the dragons, which a dragon's kind of an embellished dinosaur. So, mm -hmm. well, and, from, and, these, and from all of these, and from a genetics point, and and from a genetics point of view, Donnie, I'm sure you you, you can put in a few more there. I think we're going to continue finding. Um, uh, information in the DNA which would uh, point to a bottleneck uh, around 4,500 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, one question I, I would have for you, Mike, um, pertaining to, and you discussed this uh, today in your presentation, I really appreciate your BEDS hypothesis in answering many of the challenges to flood geology. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, have you been confronted or are you familiar with any real rebuttals or challenges to that hypothesis that you put forth, Mike? No, I haven't come across any of them. Uh, but, you know, I'm isolated up here in Montana. <laughs> and um, so I don't, I just generally don't uh, come in contact with uh, uh, evolutionists and other people like that so i'm just kind of peacefully do my research but i get some stuff online but i have not seen any uh rebuttals to it but i'm sure they're out there it's just i'm right. not aware of them at this point right nothing convincing nothing yeah i find it to be a very powerful um explanation and as you pointed out the last time you were here you did a presentation it would uh expect um many observations and those observations have have been observed you know from the beds hypothesis starting point um so george i see a couple of questions here that you you put in i'm not sure if you want to get to them i know there's one on varves one on the um the biomass yeah i'll i'll, uh, I'll touch on the uh, varves first and then we'll get into uh biomass but um you, you saw mike I, I presented some of those ash ash beds which show different counts in varves between mm -hmm. them yes. how, how do the uh, evolutionists slash old earth proponents uh, explain that away i have not come across there any explanation but i'm sure they have them i just i uh, not aware of them i haven't come across them yet i'm sure they're out there they they you know they seem to have a rebuttal or an answer, a dodge for practically everything we say. So, yeah, and I, I look at those those uh, uh, responses. Some of them dodges, as I call them, and find. And a lot of times I will write about them, and a lot of times I find that they're just um, ad hoc. They just don't. Uh, they don't seem to have evidence. They're just uh, a lot of them. Sometimes they are substantial and. And they are a challenge, and we need to think about them and work on them. So uh, it, it's it's variable. But I, as far as uh, the ash la layers and the, the different amount of, by the way, the rhythmites, um, barbs are, are technically defined as a one-year couplet. So I haven't come across any what they've said about them, but I'm sure that it's out there. I, well, I agree I, with you, Mike. Real quick, George. It, it is a lot of, I find there's a lot of, uh, post hoc, ad hoc, reasoning, rationalization, and dodging. But it just brings me back to the Bible, which is our starting point, Second Peter 3. Yes. You know, there's going to be scoffers. They're willingly ignorant of the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. So yes. instead of tapping out to these fantastic explanations, they continue to scoff, just as uh, the Bible predicted. So great response. Uh, go ahead, George. Yeah, I uh, I always summarize it in three words: deny, reject, dismiss, and then they call you a liar. <laughs> That's always the case. They call you a liar, liar for Jesus. Oh, unbelievable! Oh yeah, I know, I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah. George, you mentioned biomass. What's this all about? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to show you a bit of maths here. I hope people – that's not very difficult maths, by the way, but um, just bear with me while I bring up the screen. Uh, <clears throat> okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, now – I remember years ago I read this somewhere. I just couldn't remember where it was because it just kept coming up, this, this question about there's not enough biomass um, could have been produced in, in 6,000 years, that uh, what we find on Earth. And so so uh, last night while I was doing some reading on, on the valves and the question that we were going to talk about, I, I came up uh, in the book Refuting Compromise. I came up with uh, some information that was uh, prepared by uh, John Wood Morapi. Yeah, this, this, these are some of his calculations. He, he went and based it on today. Today, farmers in the US Midwest commonly yield uh, of uh, 10 tons per hectare of corn per year. So he did the uh, calculations. He claims that this represents uh, 10,000 10, kilogram, which is 10 ton of kilogram per hectare. Uh, one hectare, for those people that aren't aware, are 10,000 square metres. That's 10 to the power fourth, which equates to one kilogram per square metre per year. Okay, so if we assume a 1,500 years, uh, that's before the flood, of such productivity before the flood, this corresponds to 1500 kilometers sorry kilograms per square meter which corresponds to equivalent of a meter thick layer of coal now he goes on to then say well if we multiply this rate with the surface area of earth that's five times 10 to the 14th times the 1500 uh, years you get 7.5 by 10 to the 17 kilograms of biomass that's, that's a total of 750 by 10 to the 12 tonnes of hydrocarbon is possible at today's growth rates. I then did some further research. Uh, I found this, I think, in a Walt Brown book where they looked at uh, uh, estimates of um, carbon in uh, the oceans, in the coal and the oil, the animals and the plants, and the atmosphere, and you can see there my, my total, those figures total up to 4.43 times 10 to the 12 tonnes. So if we now compare that figure with that 750, you can see that it's very, it's very, actually it's 17 times higher. We, we, we can actually produce 17 times higher uh, uh, hydrocarbons than what we find on Earth today. So it's this issue about biomass, I don't know where it came from, but it, as you can clearly see there in those calculations, it, it's, it's, easy, it's easily accounted for by those figures. I mean, we, we can even reduce the figure that uh, uh, John Woodmarapi had uh, done by 17 and still be in that ballpark of 4.43 by 10 to the 12 uh, metric tons of available carbon. So, Mike, I, I know you've done some work on it, so I'll, I'll let you um, share your thoughts on it. Well, I've mentioned coal. Um, from the reserves of coal, um, there's approximately 10 times the amount of carbon in the coal um, than we have on the uh, – biomass on the earth, uh, uh, the continents today. So, but that's not a, a huge amount when we have a lot of barren areas. <laughs> um, so that implies that, that the pre-flood earth had about 10 times the amount of plants and trees. And, you know, that's that's reasonable. And uh, so a lot of that uh, uh, got buried as coal, and uh, which is essentially compressed plant uh, material. And coal um, has a lot more carbon than, than the oil and the, and the natural gas. So that's the major carbon source in the rocks today, except for the um, 
carbon that's in the sedimentary rocks themselves, the organic matters they claim. And that's what you're referring to, I believe, George, is the, the organic matter uh, mainly in the sediments like um, you have black limestone, which is high organic limestone, you have black shale. So there is a lot of uh, organic molecules in there. But you know, organic molecules may not necessarily be biological. It's another whole issue. But uh, I haven't looked into it any deeper than that, because I know that there's non-biological ways to form what they would consider an organic uh, uh, molecule, um, like a simple hydrocarbon. So yeah, I'm glad to, to hear about uh, Wood and Rocky's, uh material. I've, I've forgotten all about that. Yeah, I thought I'd put that that one to rest because uh, one specific uh, person who shall remain nameless, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about, keeps bringing that up as as some kind of uh, checkmate young Earth creationist type of story. So I thought I, I thought I'd do some research on that and just put it to bed. Well, thanks. Um... Yeah, I see there's a lot of questions. I can uh, probably quickly answer some of these if you if I can go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Mike. Well, the next question in line is, is what do I think about the hydroplate theory? Yes. Uh, not much. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I've examined it. In fact, I have a 10,000 or more word article on the CMI website, 2013. Yes. That I where I examine a lot of that stuff. Um, I uh, he has a table comparing his idea with a lot of others, like including my ideas, like on the mammoths and so forth. And I find that table very artificial. Uh, those tables, it, it you know, it seems impressive to start with, but when you look at the details, like for instance, the mammoths. He believes the mammoths were buried early in the flood by some kind of catastrophic dump of uh, hail sh uh, shot up from the fountains of the Great Deep. Uh, well, like I said, they'd be at the bottom of the sediments, and they're not. They're at the top. So uh, especially in the mammoths, the origin of Grand Canyon, I find a lot of evidence against his ideas. And he believes that, um, that I, I think he believes that most or all the asteroids and comets are from the fountains of the great deep shooting material up into the space. Now Faulkner especially has developed that. Uh, it's, uh, I think in 2013 also, um, he's gone into that, Faulkner being an astronomer, uh, delving into that and show that that couldn't possibly uh, be the case that um, all that material was shot up during the fountains of the great deep. Now, I don't know if he includes such huge asteroids like Ceres, which is almost a thousand kilometers in diameter. I'm not sure how he would explain that or whether that's part of, uh, of his explanation or whether just some of this material is from the flood. But anyway, you have problems ex having to escape the gravity of the earth, major problems. He brings up some suggested mechanisms, which I've talked to people about some of these, like a, a water hammer that make no sense and couldn't do it. So anyway, to make a long story short, I have serious problems with uh, his idea. The next one on here, can the Lake Missoula flood provide evidence for the Genesis flood? Indeed it can. In fact, I have a whole book and also a DVD with me out in the field. Uh, the title of the book is uh, uh, The Lake Missoula Flood and the Genesis Flood, where there are analogs out there like erosional remnants from the Lake Missoula flood. The uh, Lake Missoula flood formed water and wind gaps rapidly by water uh, flowing over a ridge. And so we can use that to point out all the thousands of erosional remnants on the surface of the earth like Devil's Tower, uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia, Ayers Rock in Australia. There's thousands of them. And also the thousands of water and wind gaps. A water gap is a gorge to a mountain range that was cut from, in, in this model from the top down. And then wind gaps. Um, 
they form during the Lake Missoula flood. So you can use the Lake Missoula flood as an as an analog for the Genesis flood, which is probably about 10,000 to 50,000 times the scale of the Lake Missoula flood. Let's see if what actually if I could say Mike that DVD um specifically pertaining to the question you just answered, I've it's available on YouTube. It's incredibly well done. Oh, um, okay. I've said I, I've sent it to friends and family, uh, some friends specifically who were skeptic of of the worldwide flood and who held to a local flood. After they watched that, they said, "Wow, the evidence is fascinating for a worldwide flood." Um, if I could ask you one question that kind of branches off the uh, hydroplate theory answer you provided, I've I've read your article, a very good article. I think it's titled "Analysis of um, Walt Brown's Flood Model." I guess just for clarification purposes too, for the audience, we've had you on before where you gave a presentation on, on your flood model. What mm -hmm. would be your favorite or, or the flood model you uh, most lean towards? Well, I lean about 60% towards the impact early flood and then differential vertical tectonics to drain the flood waters late in the flood. Um, because I think there was probably around 500 impacts on the earth. I don't, we, I don't think we had anywhere near the impacts that we could have had from the moon, Mars, Mercury as analogs. And 500 enough is, could cause the flood, but there's still problems with it. And I'm still doing research. That's why I only go f along with it 60%. The other model, catastrophic plate tectonics, I believe that about 30%. Um, I used to believe at 20, but I've looked at tomography lately, and there's some good stuff in there. Uh, so I think that's good enough to raise it to 30% odds. But there's glitches in that material that I don't think advocates of the CPT model have considered. Um, they show these pictures of these in subduction zones, of these nice... Uh, slabs which are have high velocity um but <laughs> found out that often that slab is an initial condition in the model so <laughs> they start with assuming that so but i don't know how much that plays into it whether that's always the case i don't think it is but when they take the slab out they get more chaotic results that it can imply other possibilities, which I have thought of, which I'm not prepared right now to really present. Um, I is still a subject of research, but there's there's enough evidence that I would go along with 30 percent. Um, so I think flood models, especially, need a lot of work. And advocates of each position, like catastrophic plate tectonics, who who believe it totally need to look at the raw data a little deeper. Um, and they're gonna find a lot of glitches. And I find them by accident because I try to keep it with about 50 earth science journals and I run into them by accident. They seem to find me. And uh, <laughs> I, I'd like the, the CPT model, catastrophic plate tectonics model to be correct. I actually would like it to be correct because I'd rather not deal with flood models because uh, there's so many other things to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I come across them, so I once in a while I publish something. But I haven't done anything for a uh, number of years on the topic, uh, except I'm looking at tomography now. But uh, maybe I'll write up something on that in the future. Anyway, that's kind of my uh, uh, feeling on flood models. And the one I favor is the impact followed by differential vertical tectonics. Now, there's a little question about the differential vertical tectonics model. Uh, people who believe in CPT generally believe that. So it's not very controversial because the evidence is all over. It's just the uh, beginning of the flood that's the uh, major issue. And so the whole area is a subject of massive research effort and uh, uh, among the many unknowns in their science and the, and the lack of data we have in a lot of, a lot of areas. I appreciate that answer, Mike. Very informative. I appreciate your critical thinking. And a point you made last show that you were on, correct me if I'm wrong, you pointed out how important it is to have multiple working hypotheses 
when right yes yeah in areas where um things are uncertain or like in earth science there's just a lot of unknowns and and a lot of uh interpretations that are probably wrong or half wrong there's just a mix of of things and so it's best to have several models out because a model that takes over becomes what is called the ruling hypothesis and it tends to to uh reject a lot of uh, good data that doesn't fit and um ignore a lot of data and just fit it all into their their model of uh tc chamberlain a geologist uh, wrote about it in the early in the late 1800s and said that uh, this is a good principle to start with and there's nothing wrong with that uh, when there's a lot of unknowns out there to have multiple working hypotheses uh, we should do research on them and eventually we can either reject uh, uh, some or 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 we can modify them i mean we can do all kinds of things but we should have more than one dominant model out there. I mean, we shouldn't have any dominant model in, in flood model out there right now. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well, as we um, come towards the two hour mark, Mike, time really flies by with you. You are a wealth of information, a huge uh, help to the audience as well. They're all uh, lots of good feedback. As we come up to the two hour mark, maybe we'll, we'll kind of get in these last couple of questions that we do have. Um, I think you can see this one as well, Mike. It's right after the Lake Missoula flood question. Um, the question is, critics have claimed that the existence of the Hawaiian Islands and the dates derived through dating methods confirm or corroborate with an old Earth. And then they'll say, you know, this refutes young Earth. Um, what are your thoughts overall on, on those kinds of claims? Well, um there does seem to be older ages as you go along the Hawaiian islands out to the uh, west northwest and then as you cut north northwest along the emperor emperor sea mounts which are considered a, a continuation of this hot spot you get even older dates but it's i i i think there's probably um more variable dates in there also, you have some hotspot tracks. These are called hotspot tracks. Uh, you have some hotspot tracks that uh, don't fare too well with um, the, the moving of plates slowly. Besides, all these dates uh, can be explained with uh, millions of years by um, the rate project material um, um, showing that we had a period of accelerated decay. So. The, the millions of years isn't the problem. It's the pattern that uh, would support uh, it support catastrophic plate tectonics. But there's also uh, uh, contradictions of that in other island chains. So I consider that one of the thirty percent evidences for their model is that the, these hotspot tracks. So it's 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 good, but it doesn't refute young Earth creationism right. because we have accelerated radiometric decay. Solid evidence for it in the rate project um, based on helium diffusion out of zircon crystals um, done by Russell Humphreys. And so it's not a problem. This is part of the evidence of catastrophic plate tectonics. Well, then the follow-up question that I had here, which you just answered is, can the relative dates derived from radioisotope dating methods be applied to biblical geology? And I know you've written an article on this as well. Yes, I have. So based on, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yes, in general, I think it's the case, but I think there's a lot of exceptions. Mm. But when you get into the Precambrian, which is older than 542 million years within the secular time scale, I'm not so sure those, you can use relative radiometric dates there, but I don't know. I, it's, it's, uh, it's an area where I've been thinking about and don't really know whether you can do that or not, but I say in general, you could probably use relative dates for the Thanerozoic, the fossil bearing layers. Um, but there's a lot of glitches in, in that uh, uh, data set too. Um, as, as you look at the rate material, they, they got um, fission track ages that were quite variable on, on some formations. And so 
Um, what relative date do you use then for that formation? Right. There's a wide range of them. So I there's just a lot of uh, glitches in that. Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, that's about all I can say about that at this point. Awesome. Uh, George, I was going to say something, but I know uh, there's a couple things you wanted to add as well. Yeah, look, we're, we're going to cover... We, uh, we're going to cover this um, tomorrow with uh, Professor McQueen uh, about the Hawaiian Islands, oh. where where we look at um, potassium argon dating of uh, some of these islands, which sort of then they correlate that to the um, measurements uh, that they've observed from satellites as to the tectonic plate movements. Mm -hmm. uh, without without going too too far into it, there are so many problems with that. But I'll just cite. Uh, a couple, of, a couple of things. There, there's, I'll, I'll, pre I'll present some evidence where potassium argon is completely unreliable. It, it, it really is. It's completely unreliable. Yes, I and believe the, that. And the tectonic plate movements that's that can be refuted really, really simply through the cold subduction plates. They, these these subduction plates are 700. They they actually protrude down to 700 kilometers into the Earth. And there, there are um, so, some reports that I've mentioned that that I've read um, actually quote uh, they're actually 680 to about 1650 degrees centigrade cooler. How how could that be? And I'll show you that yeah. these these plates at the at the rates of subduction that they talk about should take 9.3 million years. Well, why aren't these subduction plates? in equilibrium to the surrounding temperature of the mantle it's completely bogus it's 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 ridiculous sort of um mathematics that they show very biased the, by the way the very biased. Are, are assumptions too yes yeah um well, oh go ahead mate yeah i've been in hawaii a couple times and uh um i I found a, a number of mysteries, but yeah, I better not get off on on, on that. <laughs> <laughs> we could be here for because we're uh, we're coming short of time, and you have more questions. Yes, yeah. Um, time flies by, and and questions are coming in as well. That's why I, I definitely want to get a couple of these audience ones. I think for the most part, we've answered all the ones that we've got saved in the side chat. Um, mm -hmm. Unless Mike, you do see one that that we may have missed. Um, but I had a couple questions come in here. One from a couple from Jamie Russell. So Jamie, I apologize. I'm looking for your question right now and I hope I didn't lose it. Um, I guess this is the one maybe. Jamie, I hope this is the main question you were looking to get answered. He, he just asked Mike, uh, I put it up on screen. He says, is the main problem the number of impact craters on the earth? Well, yeah. I mean, I did a calculation using the moon as an analog, <laughs> adjusted to the greater uh, gravitational cross-sectional area of the Earth, and uh, uh, Wayne Spencer did the same thing, and we got we got a huge number of impacts that would probably melt the mantle. So obviously, that can't be. But I have just done a calculation on what are the number of impacts and. Um, well, there's 190 that are claimed to be confirmed as of 2017. I wish they'd update that website. And um, but anyway, that's what they claim, 190. But there's about uh, based on Africa, there was a big report somewhere, Earth Science Review or something about the number of possible impacts being twice as many in Africa. So I, you know, these are subject to research. Some will be impacts and some will not. Uh, so I said, well, maybe half of them are. Well, for Africa, that would double the number of, of impacts there. And if this is the case uh, on all the continents, that would add up to about 380. Then I consider a lot of these uh, cratonic basins in the continents, they're saucer shaped, you know, make our, 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 and probably been distorted with some uh, subsequent uh, tectonics. Many of those, I believe, are impact craters. And so I figured that 
of there's about 764 basins, but many of these basins are fore arc basins, back arc basins, and fold and thrust basins that don't count. But some of them would could be uh, others, like cartonic basins, marginal sea basins could be uh, impact craters. So I estimate maybe about 100 from this data set and rounded off to 500. So I think that probably the Earth was affected by 500 impacts. I believe that vast majority of impacts in the solar system occurred on day four, and there's, and there's strong evidence for that. Well, some occurred during the flood. For instance, on Mars, which I've been looking at, there's, there's huge magnetic uh, anomalies there, and these anomalies go right through many of the uh, small to moderate sized impact craters on the southern highlands. Uh, in other words, that impacting occurred while there's a strong magnetic field. And according to personal communication from Russ Humphreys, the half life from a, uh, the magnetic field of the Mars building at creation is 308 years. So that magnetic field would be there at the early end, but uh, by the time of the flood, it wouldn't be there. And there's big craters and some small and medium-sized ones that, that totally wiped out the impacts. Plus the volcanism on Mars totally wiped out the, 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 the magnetic field, indicating that they came well after the magnetic field had, had decayed and they could be easily fit into the flood. Um, so I believe the vast majority of impacts in the solar system occurred on day four by um, a doctor, um, 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 let's see, um, Danny Faulkner's at day four cratering hypothesis. It's part of the creation on day four of all the, the Earth is made on day one, so it doesn't apply. But all the other solid bodies of the solar system were made on day four. And in the process of making them out of pre-existing material, there is some leftover debris that, that just impacted the surface making the craters. So I, after uh, resisting that for 20 years, I now come to believe it because of the Mars magnetic uh, um, uh, material that's, that's, that's imprinted in the, in the crust of, of, of Mars. So... Anyway, that's how we would uh, explain impacts. <laughs> so I think there's only 500 during the flood. Well, I appreciate that, uh, my great response. As, as we kind of wind down here, I want to respect your time, Mike. You're always so generous with us. I did notice I missed one question in the side chat. Um, it kind of related, I guess, to the hydroplate theory response you gave earlier, but mm -hmm. it's a question from uh, somebody with the username Pickled Grammar. So I appreciate your question. He says, in relation to the hydroplate theory, would you believe the entire Pacific plate completely collapsed during the flood? The entire Pacific plate collapsed. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Um, George, uh, does that make sense to you? The I just work here, Mike. I just read the questions. Well, the Pacific <laughs> Plate covers half the half the world. Uh, it's huge. Um, I think there's a lot more to it uh, when you talk about plates. Plates can be defined as uh, with by volcanism and uh, earthquakes at the boundaries. That's how I would define plates. Um, whether plates move horizontally or not, that I think there's that 30% that it, they do and 70% and there, there's glitches. I found a lot of glitches mm -hmm. and uh, in that. And um, But whether they collapse, I don't, I'm not sure what that means. They, they sunk. Actually, I'm kind of toying with the idea that uh, the oceans were at higher altitudes than, and uh, maybe were the some of the pre-flood continents before the flood and they've, they've sunk because um, this is res more research in, in progress. Um, it's looking like to drain the floodwaters, the ocean basin sank and the continents rose up. But the continents have an average of 2,300 meters of Phanerozoic sediments and maybe about 
900 meters of Precambrian. Um, so that's maybe about 3,200 meters. And then what was washed off during the recessional stage of the flood was at least 1,900 meters. So you had almost 5,000 meters of sediment average on the continents at the peak of the flood, indicating that the crust was, was down below 5,000 feet below the floodwaters, which is below the average depth of the ocean of 3,800 meters right now. So based on all this that I'm working on with Dr. John Reed and Peter Klevberg, I'm coming to the conclusion that, that the oceans, like the Pacific, um, probably could have been land or much of it land uh, before the flood. In fact, there's evidence for that. And the, the Belt Supergroup is a huge area, about 500 uh, kilometers in diameter. It's generally circular. I think it's an impact crater, 20 kilometers deep of sediments. Uh, it goes clear out to eastern Washington. Northeast Washington or eastern Washington is the western edge of it. The paleocurrent directional indicators in that material, that vast amount of sediments. By the way, the top has been eroded a lot, and the bottom we can't find. So 20 kilometers is a minimum depth. Uh, that material came from the west. It's dated as Mesoproterozoic, about uh, oh, in the Precambrian, a dated. Uh, by secular geologist, uh, 1.4 billion to 1.3 billion years uh, came from the West. So what's out there to the West to uh, produce all this massive amount of uh, Precambrian sediments, which I think was deposited very early in the flood. There's evidence, I believe, that it's a, a flood deposit. So that would indicate some source out there in the uh, now the Pacific Ocean. So anymore stay tuned <laughs> <laughs> this is a long research project and a lot of ramifications that i'm i uh working on right now this uh, this very time uh, especially that I, it's a high priority with me well i appreciate those informative answers and all the research you do because one of the questions um in the chat had to do with you know, what you believe are some of the most important research topics to look into as you're doing when it comes to flood geology that could lead to resolutions and answers in, in the next 10 years. And, oh, and yeah. The sediments. The, the, the sediments, because um, uh, where they're located in the oceans or on the continents, uh, and we're getting a handle on that. We're, we're finding answers to that. Some of the older data uh, by Ronov, for instance, on the continents was probably too high. And there's other estimates by other that are probably too low. But it was why. But now I think we're getting good estimates now from uh, secular research that, and we we shouldn't have a dispute with this because this is an interpretation. This is this is actually data that they're finding um uh the and so this has a lot to say for the flood for instance if you have 5000 meters average on the continents at the peak of the flood day 150 what does that imply about the early flood um we got to find somewhere where it eroded from transport it and then deposit it rapidly i mean <laughs> This is hugely cata catastrophic. I'm working on where did it come from? I mean, transport is probably not a, a problem because you probably had really rapid currents early in the flood. Um, but where did it originate? That's what I've been thinking about. Also, the water conditions were uh, probably very hot. I just did a paper on dolomite, which will be published in the Creation Research Society quarterly that indicated to deposit dolomite, which is approximately 10% of all sedimentary rocks, you need temperatures over 100 degrees centigrade and probably well over it. So you had a lot of hot water in the flood. This makes a big difference on, on, on several features. So there's a lot of, um, this is the, my major project right now, the sediments and has a lot of ramifications in a lot of other areas of flood geology. So it's, a, to me, exciting 
uh, research that um, nobody else is doing, of course, except John Reed, Peter Kleberg, and I. It is very exciting. You know, it's, it, I always say it's an exciting and, and a great time to be a young earth creation. It is. Research and, <laughs> you know, it, it, we're never bored because of it. There's endless research and topics to study. Yes. Uh, Mike, I, I, I really respect your time. We're going over two hours. Let's um, maybe answer this last question that came in in the form of, uh, of a super chat, a donation. So I appreciate it. Um, are, are you familiar with, with this one, Mike? This one uh, comes in, I put it up on screen and the question is how do you account or what are your thoughts on the Uluru and Katajuta in Australia with the flood? George, um, you could probably pronounce those better than me, but. Yeah, I, Uluru is Ayers Rock, I think, and Katajur is a, a erosional remnant of um, conglomerate, I believe. Right, George? Yeah, it's about right. Uh, you did all right, Donnie. You pronounced it fairly well. <laughs> I <laughs> oh, I can't even pronounce English words correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not even going to try. Um, yeah, I have some opinions on those. Those are original remnants of uh, when the flood uh, eroded um, an average of 1,900 meters off the continents. Uh, it left some erosional remnants. And... Um, uh, Ayers Rock, I think, is especially an interesting erosional remnant in that it's uh, vertical arcos sandstone. Uh, arcos uh, with a lot of feldspar. Um, feldspar weathers quickly, so this represents a deposit that had to be de uh, deposited rapidly. But below the ground, I'm, I believe from some research from Andrew Snelling years ago that it goes, what, six kilometers deep, this strata, the vertical strata, which Ayers Rock is just a little tiny piece sticking out about um, 1,200 feet high. But down below, you have all the rest. I think what this is is, is a dome uh, early in the flood where you had a, a – first of all, you deposited this Arcos fel, high feldspar sandstone rapidly, and then you domed it up like this. Um, thousands of meters, and it got eroded off, except for that little erosional remnant of that Ayers Rock, which isn't so little when you look at it. It's but a uh, 1,200 feet tall. So these features like this have a lot to say about what happened in the flood, early flood, late flood. Um, I'm, I'm more and more impressed by the catastrophism. And I might add that all these things that I look at uh, that are evidence for the flood, I find that are, that are very difficult for uniformitarians to explain a lot of these features. So um, I'm just not, uh, uh, besides finding evidence for the flood, I, I find a lot of contradictions to uniformitarians and trying to explain these things by slow processes over millions of years. For instance, the deposition of six kilometers of, of uh, high feldspar sandstone. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a, a problem in itself. So I find problems all over for them. I find problems for flood geology too, but um, I find a lot of answers uh, to sum it up. I find a lot of answers that uh, make a lot of sense within the the flood model, uh, the general flood model from scripture. Well, I appreciate that answer, uh, Mike, and I appreciate you being so willing to provide these in informative answers. Uh, you know, even after the two hour mark, you've got great endurance. This was a great, uh, great show, uh, a great Q and a, anybody who's just joined us. Um, cause we have had a lot of people just join us now. Um, please go back when this uh, stream is over and make sure you watch the uh, opening presentation on the Green River Formation. Very important. And then we've now spent uh, a little bit over an hour on, on a Q&A. So, Mike, it's always a pleasure. I, I always appreciate you being so willing to do this and help us answer these important questions and challenges to flood geology. Um, You're welcome. I appreciate that. George, any final words? Before we yeah, uh, shut it down for the night, I I, I I find that interesting in the chat. Sorry, I got involved in the chat a little bit, but um, <laughs> Mike, they were questioning 
your qualifications in geology. So I find that quite quite um, amazing, really, when you think about what what was Darwin, what was Lyell. That's, what a ridiculous argument, really. I mean, these guys need to get a life. Well, if that's their only argument, uh, challenge my qualifications. That's a very poor very poor argument for anything, uh, called an ad hominem argument. Yeah. It doesn't matter what my qualifications are. What matters is the evidence I present and how, how solid it is. That's what they need to challenge. Amen, brother. Exactly. Well exactly said. Yeah. Well said. Well, we leave our, our, our chats. Uh, we do these live, so we welcome questions, objections, and we, uh, we present them all. So, uh, Mike, as, as you put it, if that's the best... Uh, <laughs> argument and criticism <laughs> they have uh, that's actually a good sign and and it's good for us so yes. so george i appreciate those those final words final thoughts and any final words final thoughts from you uh, mike before we shut it down no um nope i think i've talked enough yes <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it you got a lot of endurance uh every time you're on we go over two hours and time flies by it's a ton of fun lots of great feedback and compliments towards you mike uh, donny what a yeah george i was gonna tell you one of my jokes go ahead we can end it with a joke <laughs> we'll <laughs> okay. end it with, uh, some okay good for our health five surgeons okay we're talk we're talking um, at a coffee break and we're discussing their work. The first one said, I think accountants are the easiest to operate on. You open them up and everything inside is numbered. <laughs> the second one said, I think librarians are the easiest to operate on. You open them up and everything inside is in alphabetical order. The third one said, I like to operate on electricians. You open them up and everything inside is color coded. The fourth one said, I like to operate on lawyers. They're, they're heartless, spineless, gutless, and their heads <laughs> and their butts are interchangeable. <laughs> Wait, the fifth, the fifth surgeon said, I like engineers. Wow, hey, engineers. They always understand when you have a few parts left over at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Great. George, you're going to make some... George, you're going to make some of our lawyer supporters very unhappy with that joke. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great place to end it. Uh, George, thank you for the humor. Laugh that, was a, that, was a that was a dig at engineers as well. That's true. And, and you're yeah. an engineer, so you're a good sport. Yeah. You need some weather jokes next time. <laughs> oh, uh, you're, you're on, Mike. You're on. <laughs> you guys are great. Oh, you by, guys the, are great. by the way, I'll send you that info that we were talking about earlier in an email, okay? Okay. Okay. Nice to see you again. Nice to talk to you, uh, Mike. Okay, take care. I appreciate too, it, gentlemen. God bless. Mike, George, God bless you guys. God bless you, brothers. Uh, everybody in the chat, God bless you as well. I hope this was informative and edifying. Thank you for all your awesome questions. Uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow night. George, correct me if I'm wrong, 7 EST uh, for a presentation on the Hawaiian Islands. So we'll see you then. Guys, Standing for Truth is out. Out. Out.